name is Labray, and my story begins rather eventfully on an evening in the year 1640. The setting, quite appropriately, a theater in Paris. The hero, quite appropriately, Cyrano de Bergerac. <laughs> Sirs, have you seen Monsieur de Cyrano? Not here. But Cyrano not here? Astonishing. This is Cyrano. Who is he? Oh, he is the lad with the long sword. It doble? Sufficiently. His friend Lebray can tell you more. Uh, Lebray, uh, looking for Bergerac? Yes, and for trouble. Ah, is he not an extraordinary man? Mm, the best friend and the bravest soul alive. Poet, swordsman, musician, philosopher. Such a remarkable appearance, too. And such a nose. My lords, there is no such nose as that nose. You cannot look upon it without crying, Oh, no, impossible, exaggerated. And then you smile and say, Why, of course, I might have known. Presently he will take it off. But that Monsieur de Bergerac will never do. He keeps it, and God help the man who smiles. Cyrano, not here? Astonishing. Why so? Why? Moon Fleury plays. And what is that to Cyrano? Have you not heard? Monsieur de Bergerac so hates Moon Fleury, he has forbidden him for three weeks to appear upon the stage. Well. Moon Fleury plays. Yes, what then? Ah, that is what I came to see. Yes, Cyrano had forbidden the actor, Montfleury, to appear on the stage. When Montfleury had the temerity to make his first entrance, Cyrano, his hat cocked ferociously, his moustache bristling, his nose terrible, drove him into the wings. Naturally, there was some objection from the crowd. One stout-hearted patron even dared approach Cyrano directly with his complaint. After all, monsieur, we came to see the play. What reason have you to hate this Montfleury? My dear young man, I have two reasons, either one alone conclusive. Primo, a lamentable actor. Secundo, well, that's my secret. Oh, but what a scandal! Montfleury, the great Montfleury. Did you know the Duc de Candal was his patron? No. Who is yours? No one. No one? No patron? I said not. What? No great lord to cover with his name? No, I have told you twice. Must I repeat? No, sir, no patron, but a patroness. Oh, yes. And when do you leave Paris? That's as may be. The, the Duke de Candal has a long arm. Mine is longer by three feet of steel. Oh, yes, yes, but... but do you dream of daring? I do dream of daring. But you... You may go now. But you... Could... You may go. Or tell me, why are you staring at my nose? Uh, no, uh, Does I... it astonish you? Oh, your grace misunderstands. Is it I... long and soft and dangling like a trunk? I never said... Or oh. crooked like an owl's beak? I... Uh... Perhaps a pimple ornaments the end of it. No. Or a fly parading up and down. What is this portent? Oh. This phenomenon? Oh. But I've been careful not to look. Oh, oh. And why not, if you please? Why? It disgusts you, then. Oh, my dear sir. Does its color appear to you unwholesome? Oh, by no means. Or its form obscene? Not in the least. Then why assume this deprecating manner? Uh, possibly you find it just a trifle large. Oh, no. Small. Uh, very small. Uh, infinitesimal. What? How? You accuse me of absurdity? Small? My nose? Why? Oh, magnificent, my nose. You pug, you knob, you buttonhead. Know that I glory in this nose of mine, for a great nose indicates a great man. Genial, courteous, intellectual, virile, courageous as I am, and such as you, poor wretch, will never dare to be, even in imagination. For that face, that blank, inglorious concavity which my right hand finds <coughs> on top of you is as devoid of pride, of poetry, of soul, of picturesqueness, of contour, of character, of nose, in short, as that which at the end of that limp spine of yours, my left foot... <coughs> Take notice, all who find this feature of my countenance a theme for comedy. <laughs> ah, when the humorist is noble, then my custom is to show appreciation proper to his rank, more heartfelt and more pointed. Presently this fellow will grow tiresome. Duh, he blows his trumpet. Observe, I myself will proceed to put him in his place. <clears throat> ah, your nose, your nose is... Rather large. Rather? Oh, well. Is that all? Well, of course. Ah, no, young sir, you're too simple. Why, you might have said, 
Oh, a great many things. Mon Dieu, why waste your opportunity? For example, thus. Aggressive. I, sir, if that nose were mine, I would have it amputated on the spot. Friendly. How do you drink with such a nose? You ought to have a cup made especially. Descriptive. Tis a rock, a crag, a cape. A cape? <laughs> Say rather a peninsula. Inquisitive. What is that receptacle? A razor case or a portfolio? Kindly. Ah, do you love the little birds so much that when they come and sing to you, you give them this to perch on? Insolent. Sir, when you smoke, the neighbors must suppose your chimney is on fire. Cautious. Take care. A weight like that might make you top-heavy. Thoughtful. Somebody fetch my parasol. These delicate colors fade so in the sun. A pedantic. Does not Aristophanes mention a mythologic monster called Hippocampelephantocamelas? Surely we have here the original. Familiar. Well, old torchlight, hang your hat over that chandelier. It hurts my eyes. Eloquent. When it blows, the typhoon howls, and the clouds darken. Dramatic. When it bleeds, the Red Sea. Enterprising. What a sign for some perfumer. Lyric. Hark, the horn of Roland calls to summon Charlemagne. Simple. Eh, when do they unveil the monument? Respectful. Sir, I recognize in you a man of parts, a man of uh, prominence. Rustic. Eh? What? Call that a nose? <laughs> I be no fool like what you think I be. That there's a blue cucumber. Military. Point against cavalry. Practical. Why not a lottery with this for the grand prize? Or, parodying Faustus in the play, was this the nose that launched a thousand ships? These, my dear sir, are things you might have said had you some tinge of letters or of wit to color your discourse. But wit, not so. You never had an atom. And of letters, you need but three to write you down. An ass. But and moreover, if you had the invention here before these folk to make a jest of me, be sure you would not then articulate the twentieth part of half a syllable of the beginning. For I say these things lightly enough myself about myself, but I allow none else to utter them. Ugh, these arrogant grandees, a clown who would look at him, not even gloves, no ribbons, no lace. No buckles on his shoes. I carry my adornments on my soul. I do not dress up like a popping jay, but inwardly I keep my daintiness. But... But I have no gloves. A pity, too. I had one, the last one of an old pair, and lost that. Very careless of me. Some gentleman offered me an impertinence. I left it in his face. Dolt, bumpkin, fool, insolent puppy, jabinol. How do you do? And I, Cyrano, Savignan, Hercule de Bergerac. Very well. You wish to fight, so be it. You shall die exquisitely. Poet. Why, yes, a poet, if you will. So while we fence, I'll make you a ballade extempore. A ballade? Yes, do you know what that is? I... The ballade, sir, is formed of three stanzas of eight lines each. Oh, come. And a refrain of four. You... I'll compose one while I fight with you. And at the end of the last line... Thrust home. Will you? I will. Ballard of the duel at the Hotel de Bourgogne between de Bergerac and uh, a barbarian. What do you mean by that? Oh, that? Uh, the title. <laughs> Stop. Let me choose my rhymes. Now, here we go. Lightly I toss my hat away. Languidly over my arm let fall. The cloak that covers my bright array. Then out swords and to work with all. And as he fought, this man among men, this poet, this musician, this philosopher, this lad with the long sword and the long nose did indeed compose and recite a ballad, driving his adversary remorselessly before him until at the end, Prince, pray God that is Lord of all, pardon your soul for your time has come. Beat. 
pass, fling you a slant, a sprawl. Then, as I end the refrain, thrust home. <laughs> His adversary was run through in cadence with the words. Cyrano's triumph brought shouts of bravo, but later that evening, when we were alone... Come now, Cyrano. The real reason why you hate Montfleury. That Silenus, who cannot hold his belly in his arms, still dreams of being sweetly dangerous among the women. Sighs and languishes, making sheep's eyes out of his great frog's face. I hate him ever since one day he dared smile upon. Oh, my friend, I seemed to see over a flower great snail crawling. How? What? Is it possible for me to love? I love. May I know? You have never said whom I love? Think a moment. Think of me. Me, whom the plainest woman would despise. Me, with this nose of mine that marches on before me by a quarter of an hour. Whom should I love? Why, of course, it must be the woman in the world most beautiful. You mean... Roxanne? Yes. Roxanne. And why not? If you love her, tell her so. My old friend, look at me and tell me how much hope remains for me with this protuberance. Oh, I have no more illusions. Now and then, <laughs> I may grow tender walking alone in the blue cool of evening through some garden fresh with flowers after the benediction of the rain. My poor big devil of a nose inhales April. And so I follow with my eyes where some boy with a girl upon his arm passes a patch of silver, and I feel somehow I wish I had a woman too, walking with little steps under the moon and holding my arm so, and smiling. And then I dream, and I forget, and then I see the shadow of my profile on the wall. But your wit, your courage, Roxanne herself, watching your duel, paler than... Pale? Her lips parted, her hand thus at her breast. I saw it. Speak to her. Speak, man. Through my nose, she might laugh at me. That is the one thing in this world I fear. Cyrano's arrogance did not extend only to actors. Witness his conversation with the all-powerful Comte de Guiche. Poets are fashionable nowadays to have about one. Would you care to join my following? No, sir, I do not follow. Your duel yesterday amused my uncle, the cardinal. I might help you there. Grand Dieu. I suppose you have written a tragedy. They all have. Why not take it to him? Well, really, I... He is himself a dramatist. Let him rewrite a few lines here and there, and he'll approve the rest. Impossible. My blood curdles to think of altering one comma. Ah. But when he likes a thing, he pays well. Yes, but not so well as I. When I have made a line that sings itself so that I love the sound of it, I pay myself a hundred times. You are proud, my friend. You have observed that. Have you uh, read Don Quixote? I have. And found myself the hero. Be so good as to read once more the chapter of the windmills. Chapter 13. Windmills, remember, if you fight with them. My enemies change then with every wind. May swing round their huge arms and cast you down into the mire. Or up among the stars. What could you do with such a man? I tried scolding. You have done it now. You've made your fortune. There you go again, growling. Well, at least this latest pose of yours, ruining every chance that comes your way, becomes exaggerated. Very well, then I exaggerate. Oh, you do? Yes, on principle. There are things in this world a man does well to carry to extremes. Stop trying to be three musketeers in one. Fortune and glory. What would you have me do? Seek for the patronage of some great man and like a creeping vine on a tall tree, crawl upward where I cannot stand alone? No, thank you. 
be a buffoon in the vile hope of teasing out a smile on some cold face? No, thank you. Eat a toad for breakfast every morning, make my knees callous and cultivate a supple spine, wear out my belly groveling in the dust? No, thank you. Scratch the back of any swine that roots up gold for me, tickle the horns of mammon with my left hand, whilst my right, too proud to know his partner's business, takes in the fee? No, thank you. Be the patron saint of a small group of literary souls who dine together every Tuesday. No, I thank you. Shall I labor night and day to build a reputation on one song and never write another? Shall I find true genius only among geniuses, palpitate over little paragraphs, and struggle to insinuate my name into the columns of the Gazette? No, thank you. Calculate, scheme, be afraid... Love more to make a visit than a poem? Seek introductions, favors, influences? No, thank you. No, I thank you. And again, I thank you. But to sing, to laugh, to dream, to walk in my own way and be alone, free, with an eye to see things as they are, a voice that means manhood, to cock my hat where I choose, at a word, a yes, a no, to fight, all right, to travel any road under the sun, under the stars, nor doubt if fame or fortune lie beyond the bourne. Never to make a line I have not heard in my own heart, yet with all modesty to say, my soul, be satisfied with flowers, with weeds, with thorns even, but gather them in the one garden you may call your own. In a word, I am too proud to be a parasite, and if my nature wants the germ that grows towering to heaven like the mountain pine, or like the oak sheltering multitudes, I stand not high, it may be, but alone. Yes. Yes, tell this to all the world, and then to me say very softly that she loves you not.